visiting with us this morning. We've been working our way through John's gospel verse by verse. Really, this is part two. We're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday morning as we were looking at Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And we're going to use this passage again to prepare our hearts to come before the Lord's table this morning, uh, remembering the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus and all, uh, all that is wrapped up in the finished work of Christ. Um, so if you are, again, visiting, uh, we do practice open communion, meaning if you're with us this morning and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then we invite you to participate with us. And if you do not know Jesus Christ this morning, I recognize that's a possibility. Maybe you're visiting and you are considering who Jesus is and what he's done and thinking that, you know, is this, is this something or someone that I need to learn more about that I encourage you to watch carefully this morning as we look at the Word, and as we participate in the Lord's table, because within that service is a beautiful picture of the gospel, and one we want to be reminded of again and again and again. Um, so John 13, we're looking again, the washing of the feet of Jesus. This is just an incredible section of scripture. Uh, we are in the room with Jesus uh, and, and so as we, we get an up-close, personal look into the final hours of Christ. At this moment, as Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, he is mere hours from going to the cross where he will pay the penalty for our sin. And so in this moment, he's going to both encourage and instruct his disciples. And in doing so, he's going to encourage and instruct us. And so I want to encourage you just to feel that intimacy, what it would have been like to be in the room with Jesus this morning, right? knowing that his hour had come, knowing it was time for him to glorify the Father by going to the cross and accomplishing redemption, knowing only hours left to live, yet he is, he's looking outward, right? And we, we saw that focus last week, Jesus turning his attention to those who were with him. And, and, and so this morning, we want to be reminded of those truths and then finish up this section. So we saw Jesus last week as the king, right? But not just any king, right? Jesus is the king who loves, the king who serves, and the king who saves. And we had to stop short there of finishing our passage. This morning, we're going to see Jesus is the king who sins. And so we want to look at verses 12 through 17. Let's read it together. We'll ask the Lord's blessing on our time in his word, and we'll dig into this. I'm, i got to have a hard time adjusting to this JV pulpit this morning. So this is in preparation for the, the drama, and, and they've got practice for the teens. So, um, yeah, I miss, I, I miss the big pulpit here. Let's, let's pray. Uh, well, we'll look at the word. Uh, John 13, beginning in verse 12. When he had washed their feet... And put on his outer garments and resumed his place. He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a master greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this day that is set aside to worship you, how we need it, Lord. Uh, just to come to the beginning of a new week, we need to set this time aside to remember who you are, to remember what you have done. Lord, just to, to cast out the cares and concerns of, of this world and focus in on you, the one who has made us, the one who has saved us, the one who is worthy of all honor and glory and praise. And as we come to this point in the service, we turn our attention to your word. And we believe, Lord, that you, you have a word for us today. For us, this people, in this place, we believe that you would speak. And we ask, Lord, that you would be gracious and grant us ears to hear what you have for us. We pray, O oh God, that you would be at work in our hearts and lives. You know us. Nothing is hidden from your, 
from your face, oh God. You know the thoughts and intents of our hearts. You know those things in our life that that no one else knows of. You see us, you know us, and yet you love us. And we have been reminded of that love this morning. What a great and deep and high love, one that goes beyond our comprehension, that the Creator of all things would care about us at all, would care enough to send His Son to die for our sin. Oh Lord, we give you thanks this morning as we are reminded that it, we love you only because you first loved us. And now we humbly come before your word, asking that you would accomplish your purpose in our lives. Lord, not, not our will, but yours be done. We pray, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, in, in my life, in the life of my family, in the life of my church, Lord, in this community, in our nation, in the world in which we live, we pray your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, may your glory fill the earth this day. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and amen. So you say, where we see this idea of Jesus being the king who sins, and we really see that in verse 16, where he says, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him, right? The king, the master, the Lord, sending now his servants. And that's key, right? We are sent to serve. Sent to serve. And that's going to be our our primary focus as we look at the result of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. So let's go back to verse 12. And we we kind of reintroduced here as Jesus has gathered with his disciples around the, the table. When he had washed their feet and put on his garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? Jesus finishes this humble task, right? The, the one who is worthy to be worshipped humbly bows and washes the feet of these unworthy men. And, and, and he puts his armor, outer garment back on and sits down and he asks them a question. Do you understand what I have done? They didn't, right? They will, but they didn't understand And it's so important for us this morning that we understand what it is that Jesus did. What was he saying as he washed the feet of the disciples? Two things that are key, right? One we focused on last week, the other we're going to focus on this morning. Number one, right, Jesus was signifying the means of salvation as he washed the feet of the disciples. He is humbling himself, lowering himself, and that foot washing ultimately is pointing to the cross, right? The ultimate, the ultimate point of condescension, right? He took on himself the form of a servant and came in the likeness of men. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and became obedient. Lord, to, to the cross, even to the point of death. And we see that in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 11. But remember, Jesus said to, to Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And, and Jesus was communicating, the only means of salvation is through me. Right? That, that there is no forgiveness outside of Jesus. If you are banking your eternal life and your eternal destiny this morning on anything but the finished work of Christ, then your trust is misplaced. And Jesus makes that very clear. There is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved but by the name of Jesus. We want to be as clear as we can this morning. Salvation comes through Christ alone. 
through faith in Christ alone. Right? And, and, and so this morning, I want to make sure that you have that clear in your mind. If, if you have not been washed by Christ, you have no part with him. You say, what does that mean? That means that you have no place with him. You, that means that when you die and you stand before God, you'll hear Jesus say, depart from me. I never knew you. And you'll be cast away from his presence forever and ever in a place called hell. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that so you understand clearly how, how significant this is. What Jesus did has to do with your eternal destiny. He says, unless I wash you. The, the idea being that we are dirty. Right? Spiritually dirty. We have sinned against a holy God. And because of our sin, we are worthy of judgment. We are worthy of death. We are worthy of hell. Do you understand that this morning? Brothers and sisters, we deserve hell. That's, you, have, you just wake up in the morning and remind yourself of that. That'll change your day. I deserve hell. That's not what I have. I have life in Christ. Right? Man, that'll just change. This, yeah, whatever you have is better than hell. But if you are without Christ... If you have not been washed by him through his blood, right? if you have not put your trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sin, then you are not washed. You have no part with him. And one day you'll be separated from him forever and ever. See, number one, as Jesus washes the feet of the disciple, it's just a reminder of the means of salvation, a reminder that we have as we gather around the table this morning. And we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup. As you eat of the bread this morning, remember what Jesus said back in John chapter 6. I am the bread of life. Right? The, the bread sent down from heaven. <laughs> that, that the bread reminds us of the, of the condescension, the humility of Christ. That Jesus involved, right? Eternal with the Father, involved in the creation of all things, humbled himself and came to earth as a man. And in coming, he didn't come and say, worship me. He came as a man and he served. Right? Mark 10, 45. He did not come to be served, but to serve. And and. Last week, we saw him serve in the lowest of manners. He took, he took the role of a slave in that house. Right? The, the washing of the feet was reserved for those who were the lowest of the low in society. And Jesus says, I'll do that. And in going to the cross, he took the position that was rightly yours and mine. He took the death. He took the wrath of God that you and I deserve. And so as we eat of that bread, we are reminded of the, the condescension of Christ. That he humbled himself, lowered himself to the very point of death. And as you drink of that cup this morning, you are reminded of the shed blood of Jesus. That, that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. That it was necessary it was necessary for Jesus to die so that you could live. Right. So, so we have, number one, right, the means of salvation symbolized by the washing of Jesus' feet. And we saw that primarily last week. But we need to hit on it this morning because that's the gospel. Right? That's the good news that we, we preach and we proclaim week after week after week. And we don't get tired of it, do we? Never get tired of hearing about God's love and grace towards us and the life that we have now in Christ. But there's a second thing we see in our passage here. Right? And Jesus tells us, right, in, in, in verse 13, but, but the second thing Jesus do, does is he's setting an example of humble service for his followers. He's setting an example for you and me. You say, well, I thought he was just teaching these disciples here in this room. Yes, but that's you and me too. And we see that in his prayer in John 17. He says, I'm not praying for these only, but for all who will believe in me. 
So the instruction he's giving these disciples in this room is instruction for you and I as well. And in verse 13 he says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Right? Teacher and Lord, right? the language here is familiar. I am. Right? We, we've seen John use that again and again in his gospel, right? I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the living water. But here he says, you call me teacher and Lord, for so I am. He, John wants us to know who Jesus is and what he is about. And here he's identified as both Lord and teacher. Lord meaning, right, ultimate authority. He is the king. The king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. We, we, we talked a good deal about this, but if you don't grab a hold of that, then it's impossible to understand the true magnitude of this passage. The high and lofty status of Christ. But then he says, you call me teacher, and I am. And he is the greatest teacher. There's never been a teacher like Jesus. Right? Even those who are outside the church who do not believe in Jesus as God will say Jesus was a good teacher. Right? Great teacher. They recognize this. Oh, but Jesus was the divine teacher, communicating divine revelation. And so here we have these two positions put up against each other, painting, I think, a full picture of Christ. That as, he's, as, they, as, as we see this picture of him as Lord, we see the transcendent nature of Christ. That he is above all things. But then as teacher, he is the one who has come near. Right? He is the eminent one who has come to communicate God's truth and God's revelation to us. Isn't it remarkable that Jesus would come? And, and not only he would come, but he would communicate God's truth. You know, Hebrews 1 says God has spoken at many times and in many ways in times past. But in these last days... He has spoken to us by His Son. You want to know God's truth? You look at Jesus. You listen to Jesus. And He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. This is who Jesus is. Right? If Jesus is teacher and Lord, then guess what? You need to pay attention. You need to listen to what He has to say. And you need to follow the example that He leaves. So this is so important for us because there's no higher authority, right? No higher authority than Jesus. And that matters, doesn't it? See, the, the higher the authority, the more weight the instruction has. Do you understand that? Right? If, if we're driving down the road and I'm behind you and, and all of a sudden I pull up beside of you and I say, Hey, hey, pull over! Right. What are you going to do? You're going to look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> right? Amen. Right? You're like, who, who do you think you are? And I'm going, hey, you're going too fast. Slow down. But if, if Mike Cochran is behind you in his, in his car with the red and blue lights, and he turns those on, and he says, hey, pull over, what are you going to do? You better pull over. Right? Why? Because there's a higher weight of authority. Well, there's no higher authority than Christ. He is Lord and teacher, and we must listen to what he has to say. Right? There is no higher authority. And in here, notice in verse 14 what Jesus says to his disciples. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now you see what Jesus says here. Right? This is one big object lesson for his disciples. <laughs> Jesus looks at them he says, do you see what I did here? You go do the same. Right? So, so Jesus here gives a model, a pattern for the Christian life. This is what it looks like to be a Christian. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. He says, I washed your feet, you go and wash one another's feet.
feet. I've left you an example. Right? So let's just think carefully about the example that Jesus has left. What, what are some things that stand out about what Jesus did here? Well, he told us at the very outset, right? Number one, this is loving service, right? The, the reason why Jesus does this is primarily out of love. In verse, verse one, he says he loved his own and he loved them until the end. Now, we're really going to dive into this in a few weeks as Jesus gives this new commandment, right? Look, look at verse 34 and 35 of the same chapter here. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Right, so so the, the way in which Jesus serves here is, is primarily out of love. And then he's calling his disciples to love as he has loved. And we'll unpack that more fully when we get to it. But for this morning, we want to say this. The primary motivation for service is love. It's love. Love for God. Love for others. Right? The love of God being shed abroad in our heart. We see what Jesus has done for us. And we are moved to do that for others. That's why we must grab a hold of exactly what Jesus did here. Right? We must see how he lowered himself, how he humbled himself. We must see the deep love that he has in going to the cross and giving of himself, sacrificing himself. And you must see that it was for you. You must see how personal that is. Because until it's personal for you, you won't have that same love that Jesus has. But number one, it was a loving service. And then certainly it was a humble service. And, and we've kind of, you know, we've hit that pretty hard. And I can't stress enough, right? Foot, foot, foot washing was the job of a slave. For the lowest of the low. And Jesus willingly takes it on, thinking nothing of his high and lofty status. God incarnate washes the dirty feet of unworthy men. You say, Pastor, why do you keep hammering on this? Because it strikes at the very heart of our individualistic, self-centered culture. Right? I, I, I think we live at a point in time in history where it has become more and more about self than at any other point. The world knows this, right? The world feeds on it, right? The way in which they get to your heart is by telling you that this is all about you, right? That, that you should, Nike says, just do it, right? Burger King says, have it your way, right? This, it, that's, that's the way in which we advertise today. We do it because you deserve it, right? And, and all the advertisers know that we feel like we deserve it. And man, do they feed on that. The opposite. <laughs> yeah, this, we, are, we are a very prideful people and a prideful culture. And Jesus comes in and says, I want you to be like me. I want you to have the same attitude that I have. And his was one of great humility. Highest position Right? We are like no other people, right? I want my rights. I deserve my rights. Jesus had all the rights, but he set it all aside to humbly serve. And as his followers, he's saying what? I want you to be like that. Think about, just for a moment, who is in the room? Judas, who's going to betray him. In just a moment, Judas is going to walk out and he's going to go get the authorities and bring them back to arrest Jesus and have him executed. And Jesus knows this. Peter is going to deny him. Right? They, to a man, they're going to run and flee and hide. They're not going to stand with Jesus in the end. And yet, he washes their dirty, stinking feet. 
They didn't deserve it. And so this morning, as we think about this, I want you to think about your own relationships. I want you to think about the people in your life. Who, are, who in your life do you feel is least worthy of your love and service? For some of you, that doesn't take very long. Who in your life is least worthy of your love and service? And Jesus would say to us this morning, what? Wash their feet. Humble yourself. You say, preacher, you don't know what you're saying. You don't know who, who I'm thinking about. You don't know who's in my mind. I don't know. But I know who was in the room with Jesus. I know what they did, and I know how they hurt him, and yet he, he bowed down before them and washed their feet. It was a loving service. It was a humble service. It was an intimate service. And I, I, I need to point this out, right? The only way in which this is accomplished is if you allow yourself to get close enough to someone to do this. And I have to say it because kind of... Culturally, we are very individualistic, and we like to keep people at arm's length. That's certainly true within the context of the church. Right? There are some of you who, oh, you're faithful as can be, but you're not really involved. You don't know anybody else who's part of this faith family here this morning. You come, you hear the word, you receive, you receive, you receive, and you walk out the door, and that's the end of the story for you. That's not what the Christian life looks like. The Christian life requires us to be involved in one another's lives. There's an intimacy here, and, and you say, well, that gets messy. I've been hurt. I've been burned, right? I, I, I've allowed myself to get close to people, and, and I've been hurt. Do you think it didn't hurt Jesus to watch Judas walk out of that room? You think it didn't hurt Jesus as he knew Peter was going to deny him with curses? You think, you think it didn't hurt as they all fled and ran away? You know it hurt. Yeah, it can get messy to get intimate and get close and be involved in the lives of people, but it's necessary. It's necessary. Some of you are really good at keeping people away. Right? You push them away. You don't want them to get too close. You don't want them to see. You don't want them to know you, really. But I want to encourage you this morning. If we're going to follow Jesus' example here, we've got to let people in, and we've got to get close. And that's going to happen as you get involved in the life of the body of Christ. Not, not only, right, Sunday morning church, but, man, small groups. This is, this is where life really gets connected. You get to know people at a closer level. Serving in different ministries. As you serve together, you get to know each other. Wednesday night prayer time as we pray for one another. You need to be involved in the life of the body of Christ. You've got to get close to people. It's a loving service. It's a humble service. It's an intimate service. It's a service of forgiveness. Right? And we see this as Jesus is washing, right? We saw, he said, if, if you are not washed, you have no part with me. This is talking about taking a full bath, complete forgiveness. But then he says, Peter, you have, to, you have to wash your feet if you want to be close with me. There has to be a regular washing. We said that refers to regular confession, right, for us as, as God's people. And if I confess my sin, he's... Faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. But if this is what Jesus has done for us, then guess what, brothers and sisters? It's what we have to do for one another. I shudder inside when I hear a Christian or a professing Christian who says, I will never forgive them. If that's you this morning, you need to think carefully about what you're saying. I will never forgive them. You know, when we, we pray the model prayer that Jesus gives in Matthew 6, we pray something like this. Father, forgive me 
as I have forgiven them. Right? That's the prayer that Jesus gave, the model. Right? Forgive me as I have forgiven them. If you are unwilling to forgive someone, ooh, man, that's a scary prayer to pray. But Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. If you do not have the capacity in you to forgive someone else, you don't fully understand what you have been forgiven of. You have yet to grasp the, the magnitude of God's forgiveness towards you and how unworthy you were of that forgiveness. Because no matter how bad someone has offended you or hurt you, it's nothing compared to what your sin is towards a holy God. And so, yes, it's a service of forgiveness. And this morning, God may in your heart be calling you to wash the feet of someone else, to be willing to forgive someone who has offended you, who has hurt you. And Jesus says, what I have done to you, you need to do to others. And it's finally a service of necessity. A service of necessity. And what I don't mean is you don't serve because you feel like you have to. What I mean is this, Jesus was moved to serve because of an obvious need. He's at the table with his disciples, their feet are dirty, someone was supposed to wash the feet, nobody did, and Jesus sees the need and he moves to meet the need. So, so when Jesus here says, if I have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. What is the application for us today? <laughs> you know, should, should we have foot washing services? You know, should that, you know, some people do that. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. I, I think that would go against some of the things he's actually communicating here. But what, what he is saying is this. The way to follow him, the way to imitate him is to do what he did. To, to look at the people around you and in love for them, right? Rather than being absorbed in our own self-interest, but out of love, willingly taking the place of a servant. So you see the needs of those around you and you move to meet those needs. You serve and you do whatever needs to be done to help others. Whatever. You say, whatever? Whatever. You say, I, I got this you know, modern day philosopher meatloaf in my head, right? I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. Right? Some of you are thinking, I, they, they, I would do this, and I would do this, but I would never do that. There's no qualifications here. Right? You see a need and you're moved to meet the need. See, Jesus says in verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. You say, how low do I have to go, pastor? Well, we can't go any lower than Jesus. He lowered himself as low as he could possibly go to the very point of a slave, to the lowest, dirtiest job there was because he saw a need and he moved to meet the need. He says, you, my servant, are not greater than the master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. So you see, if you're saying, I'm not going to do that, what you're really saying is, Jesus, I'm better than you. <laughs> now, you wouldn't say that. But by your actions and by your hearts, we do and we can at times. The servant is not greater than his master. And Jesus says, if I'm your master and I do this, then you should do it as well. I'm often amazed at how, how choosy we can be when it comes to service. Right? As Christians... Right? Within the body of Christ and without. This is the way that I serve. Right? This is how I serve. And, and that's it. Right? 
I, I serve in the nursery. I, I sing in the choir. Right? I, I play the piano. I, this is my minute. I mow the lawn, right? This is my ministry. I serve in this way. And heaven forbid somebody asks you to serve in any other way. Because that's your ministry, and that's how you serve. But what does Jesus say here? Servant's not greater than his master. If you see a need, you move to meet the need. You say, what does that look like? It, it, here's what it looks like, brothers and sisters. You were sent to serve. That's what it looks like. You were sent to serve. That means that tomorrow morning you're going to have opportunities to put this into practice. And the next day. And the next day. Right? You're going to have opportunities this week because you have been sent forth by Jesus to serve. You say, what is that going to look like for me? I don't know. It's going to look different for you than it looks like for me. But you know what? You're going to see needs. And it's it's up to us as followers of Christ not to be so self-absorbed that we don't even see the need. Or if we see the need, we say what? I don't have time for that. I have my agenda. I have my responsibilities. Got no time for you. Got no time for that. If anybody didn't have time, it was Jesus. Hours from the cross. And yet... He humbles himself to wash the feet of these disciples. This is going to play out in countless ways in our lives. And I know many of you are like, okay, here it goes. <laughs> Preacher's going to be like, you need to be serving. You need to be serving in the church. And, and can I say, that's one way we can apply this? We can, right? There is no question when you look at the body, there are countless needs. They never stop. There are, there are ministry needs, and there are needs that your brothers and sisters have. It, it, it would be foolish for me not to use this time to say, yes, yes, I want to encourage you to fill needs and meet needs. But ministry, right, this, this command that Jesus gives is more than just about, ser about filling roles. This is about a culture of servanthood. That as followers of Jesus, this is what we are known for. It's what we are known by. Because Jesus served, we too should serve others. Don't think I don't recognize how hard that is. We have busy lives. Our calendars are full. We have our own agendas and our own plans. And for anything to step in the way, that's just going to mess and gunk it all up. But we have a higher calling, right? Not my will, but yours be done. And so, yes, there are times where we must lower ourselves, humble ourselves, so we might meet the needs. Right here within the body of Christ, we might meet the needs of our brothers and sisters, whether it's in the nursery or driving the van or, or mowing the lawn or, or countless other needs that we have within the body. And you're, if, if, you're, if you're one of those, you're kind of sitting back and you're going, I really don't even know what to do. Just ask. <laughs> we can point you in a direction. But again, we're talking about a a whole culture here. So this is going to mean serving in behind-the-scenes way where, where other people are not going to see, you're not going to know, you're not going to get recognition for what you've done. It may be that you see the need of a brother or sister, right, financially speaking, and you sacrificially come alongside and you give. And, and I can just say, pastorally, you guys have been really good at this over the years. I get to see some things that other people don't see. Some very generous, sacrificial type of gifts towards those who are in need. I've seen people give cars right, to families, places to live 
to brothers and sisters in times of need. Right? So, so it may be that God gives you eyes to see a need this week, and it's going to cost you financially, right? In the middle of all this inflation, you're going, I don't have room for that. But this is a sacrifice, isn't it? It's a sacrifice. Jesus humbles himself and lowers himself, and he gives of himself. It may mean that you see a, a couple whose home is full with little kids, and they are just constantly consumed, and, and you're saying, you know what? I could give them a couple hours of rest. Maybe they could use a date night. And, and I say, hey, why don't you bring your kids over to my house? Why don't you guys get out for a date one night? Right? You know what that would mean to some young couples who never get a moment you could do that for someone. You say, oh, I can't do little ones anymore. Well, it's a sacrifice, isn't it? It's a sacrifice, right? It, it, it may mean that you see a, a widow within the body here whose yard needs mowed, and you say, well, you know what? I can mow their yard and my yard. I could do that for them. I could take care of that need. They... That's not something they need to be doing right now. And it could be, these are just scenarios, right? Maybe it's bring a meal to someone as they're dealing with sickness or they're dealing with loss. Maybe it's opening up your home. Hospitality means so much. Jesus says, I'm leaving an example for you. And if I've washed your feet, you should wash the feet of others. You know, the men in this room, We'll never forget this day. And we shouldn't either. You know, I think of Peter here who's so bold. <laughs> Don't wash me. Oh no, do wash me. Right? I'll, never, I'll, I'll never let you down, Jesus. I'll go and I'll die with you. Oh, you're going to deny me. But you know what? Peter, Peter remembers this day. Listen, listen to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Peter says, clothe yourselves. All of you with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And, and the word that he uses here, clothe yourselves. Right? This is a word that, that means to, to take a towel and wash. That's what it means. Right? To, to gird yourself up to wash. Hey, you think that, that Peter, when he's talking about humility here, doesn't remember what Jesus did? And now he's saying, all of you, like Jesus, clothe yourselves in humility. Be like Jesus. Peter, Peter was forever changed as a result of what he saw that night. And it's my hope that we'll be changed as a result of what we see. And, and can I just say this? Right, some of you, you're hearing this, you're going, serve others, lower yourself, humble yourself. You're going, man, that's no way to live. I don't want anything to do with that. But notice what he says in verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the true path of blessing. The true path of blessing comes as you humble yourself and you serve others. Some of you are miserable, absolutely miserable. And the reason why you're so miserable is you are so consumed by what's going on in your own life and you can't get your eyes outside of it to look at anyone else. You're absolutely miserable because you're just wrapped up in your own self and your own circumstances and your own situation. And Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you. If you do them. You're not blessed because you know them. You're blessed because you do them. Right? True blessing comes as you get your eyes off of yourself and onto others. Man, some of you know that, right? Some of you have been, you have been in the middle of some of the most heart-wrenching circumstances in your life. And you have found the greatest joy for you has come in serving others in those times. Humbling yourself, meeting the needs of someone else when you are needy. Obedience brings blessing, brothers and sisters. 
Blessed are you if you do this. Having a servant's attitude will absolutely change your world. Make no mistake, right? Teenagers, this morning, right? Just think about this for a moment within the context of your home. What if, what if you served your home, your family, your brothers and sisters out of a heart of love? What if you made that your focus this week? Would that change Would that change the way you guys kind of interact and operate within the context of your home? If you didn't make it all about you, right? Mom, dad, right? Husbands, wives. If you live with a servant's heart in your home. Like, husbands, you get home from work, long day, hard day, and you say, what? I just need some time to myself. I deserve that. You probably do deserve that. But what if out of a heart of love, you look around and you see the needs of your wife and your children, and instead of saying, I need some time to myself, you pour yourself out more in service to your wife and your children. We could flip the tables, right? Wives home all day, right? And husband gets home like, I'm done. (laughs) It's time for me. But what if... What if you saw the needs and you were moved to meet those needs, right? I'm, these are examples of how your home, if everybody in your home, brothers and sisters, had a heart of service, man, it would turn the world upside down in your life, wouldn't it? What if you did this at work this week? Man, that's challenging, isn't it? Your coworkers who are always sandbagging and milking it and they, They're not working hard. Why should you work hard? Your boss, who's always on your back, right, won't won't let up. Making your day miserable, and you say, you want me to work hard? You want me to serve others in that context? Jesus says what? If I have washed your feet, you should wash the feet of others. Follow me, is what Jesus says. So we must grow in humility. And we do that, brothers and sisters, as we we look to the cross. And we're reminded of what Jesus has done for us. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, There's only one thing I know that crushes me to the ground and humiliates me to the dust. And that is to look at the Son of God and especially contemplate the cross. You want to grow in humility? You look at Jesus. You look at who he is. You look at what he has done for you. And you will be humbled. The lowliness of mind that Christ displayed should be shown forth in our lives, brothers and sisters. And this becomes a reality as we begin to see others and place the needs of others above our own. Oh, may the church be known for her humble service. Can I ask as we close this morning, what is your need? Perhaps your need is to be fully cleansed this morning. You need to be washed by the blood of Christ. You need your sin forgiven. If that's you today, humbly bow before him and confess and ask him to forgive you and to save you. And he will. All of us, brothers and sisters, need our feet washed. We've been spotted by the world we, we, we come to the table this morning and we want to ask the Lord to search our hearts and to forgive us for where we have sinned against him. And so I just want to give you an opportunity to respond this morning to that. Just with a moment of quiet, we're going to come to the table in just a moment, remembering the body and blood of Jesus. But before we do, we want to, we want to ask the Lord to search us. Is there sin in my life that needs to be confessed and forsaken? And if so, deal with that this morning. Maybe there's a relationship that needs to be dealt with. If there's bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, you need to take care of that before you come to the table today. Let's, uh, let's look to the Lord here. In just a moment of quiet, we're going to pray.